Chapter 1.8 is inverse functions. So for inverse functions, we have to recall what it is to have a composite function from the previous section. So if f of x and g of x are two functions, and we have that f of g of x equals x, so that's a composite function, f of g of x, and g of f of x also simplifies to x, that means they are inverses of each other. So what we could say is that g is the inverse of f, which we would call f inverse. So we can denote that with a little negative one superscript. So that's not an exponent of negative one. That's just the notation f inverse. And that means that f of f inverse of x equals x, and f inverse of f of x equals x. So here are the properties of inverse functions. So just like we said, for that first property, if we take a function, an inverse function, as the input to the other function, it simplifies down to x. And if we do it the other direction, we take the function as the input to its inverse function, it simplifies to x. So we'll see what that kind of means in an example in a second. And the other couple properties here, the domain of f of x equals the range of f inverse of x and the range of f inverse, or sorry, the range of f of x equals the domain of f inverse. So the domain and range for inverse functions are flip-flopped, they're reversed. So what that means is that if we have a point, an xy coordinate a comma b on f of x, then in order to find the points on f inverse, all we have to do is reverse the order of the xy coordinate so instead of a comma b, that means b comma a is going to be on the graph of f inverse. Okay, so let's go back to that first property to see an example for what that means. So let's show that these functions are inverses of each other. So we have f of x is 3x plus 2, and g of x is x minus 2 over 3. So we need to show that f of g of x equals x, and we need to show that g of f of x equals x. So composite functions, we need to show that this simplifies to x. Okay, so for the first one, for f of g of x, f of g of x, that means we're going to plug g of x into all of the x's in f of x. So that's going to be 3, instead of 3x plus 2, it's going to be 3 times g of x plus 2. So we're going to plug that in. We're going to plug in g of x. It's 3 times x minus 2 over 3 plus 2. So the 3's are going to cancel. 3 divided by 3. We're left with x minus 2 plus 2. And the 2's cancel. And that leaves us with x. So that's what we expected. We wanted to show that that equals x, and it did. So now we also need to show that g of f of x equals x. So g of f of x, that's going to be g of x, x minus 2 over 3. Instead of x, though, we're plugging in f of x. So f of x minus 2 over 3. So plugging in f of x here, that's 3x plus 2. And then it's going to be minus 2 over 3. So in the numerator, we can see that 2 minus 2 cancels. We're left with 3x over 3. And the 3's are going to cancel. And that leaves us left with x. So since both of those equaled x, g of f of x and f of g of x, that means f of x and g of x are inverses of each other. Okay, so that one we were given the two functions and we were told that they were inverses. We can also find the inverse of a function. So to do this, what we're going to do is start by replacing f of x or g of x, whatever the function notation is. We're going to replace that with a y. And then we're going to interchange the x and the y. So everywhere there is a y, we put an x. And everywhere there is an x, we put a y. So then we are going to try to solve it for y.
If it cannot be solved for, that means there is no inverse function. And then lastly, once we have it solved for y, that's going to be our inverse, so we can replace y with f inverse of x. So let's do this example. So we have f of x is 7x minus 5. So first step, let's replace f of x with a y. So that's going to be y equals 7x minus 5. And then we're going to interchange the x and the y. So everywhere there's an x, we put a y. Everywhere there's a y, we put an x. So it becomes x equals 3y, or sorry, 7y. I don't know where I got 3 from. 7y minus 5. And next, we're going to solve for y. So solving this for y, what we have to do is obviously get y by itself. We have to add 5 to both sides. And that's going to give us x plus 5 equals 7y. And then we have to divide both sides by 7. And I'm going to write the y on the left now. It's y equals x plus 5 over 7. So you can leave it like that, or you can write it as, I'll put or y equals 1 seventh x plus 5 sevenths. So that's giving each term in the numerator its own denominator of 7. x over 7 plus 5 over 7, so 1 seventh x plus 5 sevenths. And the last step here, that's our inverse, is replace y with f inverse. So our inverse function is f inverse of x equals 1 seventh x plus 5 sevenths. So if we really wanted to, we could check this by finding the composite function f of f, inver f, of f inverse or f inverse of f and making sure that we get x after we simplify, which we would. Uh, so that is our inverse function. So that was a linear equation, so that one is, it wasn't that bad. So let's do one that is not linear. This is a cubic equation because of the degree 3. So find the inverse of f of x equals x cubed plus 1. So step 1, replace f of x with y. So that's going to be y equals x cubed plus 1. Next step, interchange the x and the y. So that's going to be x equals y cubed plus 1. And now we're going to try to solve this for y. So solving this for y, we have to subtract 1 on both sides first. We get x minus 1 equals y cubed. And in order to get y by itself, the inverse operation of cubing to get rid of that exponent of 3, we have to take the cube root of both sides. So what that means is it's going to be written like this, the cube root of something. So it's a radical with a little 3 meaning cubed root. And it equals as an exponent x to the 1 third. So if we raised y cubed to the 1 third, power to a power you multiply, 3 times 1 third equals 1. So that's why it cancels that exponent of 3. So if we do that, we end up getting the cube root of the left-hand side, the cube root of x minus 1, equals y. So I'm just going to write this in the other direction. I'm going to write it as y equals the cube root of x minus 1. And that's our inverse function, so we're going to replace y with f inverse. And we get f inverse of x equals the cube root of x minus 1. Okay, so a little bit harder than linear. Linear equations are going to be the easiest. This one was a cubic one, cubic polynomial. So for the next one, these ones are going to be the hardest ones that we'll be doing in here. Um, it's going to be finding the inverse of f of x, which is x plus 2 over x minus 3. So this is a rational function because there's a polynomial in the numerator, polynomial in the denominator. So we're dividing polynomials. So let's get started with it. So same thing, let's replace f of x with a y. So we get 
y equals x plus 2 over x minus 3. Next step, interchange the x's and the y's. So we get x equals y plus 2 over y minus 3. So that y became an x and both of the x's became a y. And next step, we have to solve this for y. So solving this for y is going to be a little bit trickier than the other ones because we have two y's here, right? We have a y in the numerator, y in the denominator. Thankfully, it's pretty much the same steps every time it's a rational function. The first step is we have to cross multiply, meaning we have to multiply both sides by y minus 3. So we multiply y minus 3 on both sides. Left hand side, we get x times y minus 3. On the right hand side, it canceled. So I'll put the little steps on the right as we go. The next step is to distribute the x. So it's going to be xy minus 3x equals y plus 2. Now let's get all of the terms with a y on the left and get everything else on the right. So let's subtract this y on both sides. And at the same time, let's get this 3x on the right hand side. So let's see what we get here. So we end up getting xy minus y equals 3x plus 2 or 2 plus 3x, depending on how you want to write it. And the next tricky step here, we have to get y by itself. We still have two y's here. So what we have to do is factor out a y. So we factor out a y, we're left with x minus 1. And lastly, we have to divide both sides by that x minus 1. So it's going to be y equals, I'll write it out. So we divide by x minus 1, they cancel, divide by x minus 1. So we end up getting y equals 3x minus 2 divided by x minus 1. Or 3x, was it 3x plus 2? Sorry, that was a plus 2 up here. Plus 2, plus 2. 3x plus 2 times, or divided by x minus 1. So that is our inverse function. So last step, replace f of x with, or replace y with f inverse of x. So we end up getting our inverse function, f inverse of x, equals 3x plus 2 divided by x minus 1. So that is our inverse function for that rational function. So a little bit more complicated, but make sure you know these steps for how to solve it. Okay, so for the next thing. So the horizontal line test. So you're probably thinking of the vertical line test as soon as we say the horizontal line test. So they are related and they are actually very similar the way that we do them. So I'll mention that in a second. So the idea here is that not every function will have an inverse function. Technically, it can have an inverse, but it won't have an inverse function. So if we have the graph of f of x, we can determine if it has an inverse function by applying this horizontal line test. So what this horizontal line test says, it says that a function f of x is gonna have an inverse function f inverse of x if there's no horizontal line that intersects the graph of the function at more than one point. So it's the same concept as the vertical line test. So we'll keep on imagining horizontal lines everywhere on the graph. If it only intersects at most once, then it will have an inverse function. If it intersects more than once, it will not have an inverse function. So if a function passes the horizontal line test, they're called one-to-one -one functions and only one-to-one -one functions have inverse functions. So one-to-one -one means that each y value came from one x value. So one, x, one y value only came from one x value, that's why it's called one-to-one. -one. So for some examples here, these are relatively simple, just like the vertical line test. Let's, let's determine, uh, actually before I say this, let me, ref, let me um, refer back to the vertical line test. So the horizontal line test takes into account the vertical line test, which we'll see in a second. 
the horizontal line test essentially says if a function fails the horizontal line test, that means its inverse graph would fail the vertical line test, meaning it's not a function. Okay, so that's how they're related. For example, now let's uh, determine which of the functions will have inverse functions using the horizontal line test. So for the first one here for A on the left, anywhere that we draw a horizontal line, it's only going to intersect it once. That means it passes the horizontal line test, which means it's a one-to-one -one function, so it has an inverse function. Next one for B, if we draw a horizontal line anywhere, well, if we draw it below that vertex anyway, it's going to cross it at two different points, meaning it fails the horizontal line test because it crossed it more than once. So that means this function does not have an inverse function. Next one for C, if we put a horizontal line, say right here, it actually crosses this in three different spots. So it fails the horizontal line test, it does not have an inverse function. Last one for D, no matter where we put, I'll put it down here this time, it doesn't matter. Because no matter where we put it, it's only going to intersect it once. So that means it passes the horizontal line test, so it does have an inverse function. Okay, so notice that all of these graphs represented functions because they all passed the vertical line test. So not every function will have an inverse function. Okay, so for the next thing, uh, it's the graphs of inverse functions and how they're related to each other. So if you remember from the first page, the inverse functions have ordered pairs, the x, y coordinates are interchanged. So x becomes y and y becomes x. So that means the graph of f inverse is going to be the graph of f of x reflected over the line y equals x. So here we have this little graph of both of them. So we have this blue one. So this graph, this blue one right here is f of x. It has the coordinate a comma b on it. It just represents whatever coordinate that falls on that graph. That means the coordinate b comma a is on f inverse. And we can see that this graph of f inverse, this green one, is a reflection of f of x over the line y equals x. So it is a perfect mirror image over that line y equals x. So we should know what y equals x looks like. It's the line with slope 1, y-intercept of 0. So for example, let's graph the following functions. So these are obviously inverses because that's how it's labeled. We have f of x is 3x plus 2, and f inverse is x minus 2 over 3. So let's graph, let's graph um, f of x first. 3x plus 2, so that's going to be y-intercept of 2, slope of 3, so we go up 3 over 1. These are linear, so we connect it with a straight line. So here's f of x. So now let's graph f inverse of x. So f inverse, we can rewrite x minus 2 over 3 as x over 3 minus 2 over 3, which is 1 third x minus 2 thirds. Right, so we can give that denominator of 3, we can split up that fraction, give that denominator to each term in the numerator. So that's going to have a y-intercept of negative 2 thirds, so that's down here, negative 2 thirds, do that in green, and it's going to have a slope of 1 third, so we're going to go up 1 and over 3. So up 1 and over 3 is going to be about right here, so obviously it's not on perfect, line, perfect um, grid corners, so it's a little bit more annoying, but then we connect these lines or connect these points, connect uh, creating a line, and we get this line, this is f inverse of x. Okay, so we know these are inverses, so that means they should be reflections over the line y equals x. So here is that dotted line y equals x. So we can see that maybe if you turn your head 45 degrees to the right, um, you can see that these are mirror images over that line y equals x. Uh, just kind of verifying that these are, in fact, inverse 
functions. So something that we should also notice here is that the y, looking at f of x here, the y-intercept of f of x was 2. That is actually the x-intercept of the inverse because x, y are flipped. And the y-intercept of f inverse is negative 2 thirds, which we can see is the x-intercept of f of x. So just another uh, another point just verifying that they are inverse functions. Okay, so for the last thing here, let's use the graph of f of x to graph the inverse function. So we have the graph of f of x on the left graph, and let's graph the inverse on the right. So to do that, we know it's going to be a reflection over the line y equals x. So we're going to be taking that line and reflecting it over the line y equals x. But we don't have, uh, I want to graph this on a different graph on the right. So the way that we're actually going to do this is by reversing the xy coordinates. So we're going to interchange them. So we have three coordinates on the left, so they're going to correspond to three coordinates on the right. So let's look at that coordinate first, negative 3 comma negative 2. So we're going, to rev we're going to flip that, interchange the x and the y. Instead of negative 3 comma negative 2, we're going to have the coordinate negative 2 comma negative 3. So we just flip the x and the y. Now for the coordinate negative 1 comma 0, instead of negative 1 comma 0, we're going to have the coordinate 0 comma negative 1. And instead of the coordinate 4 comma 2, we're going to have the coordinate 2 comma 4. So now we just have to connect those in the same way that it was connected over on the other graph. So something like that. And this is our inverse function f inverse of x. So you can see that it's easier to see if they were on the same graph. But hopefully you can see that these are mirror images over the line y equals x. Okay, so that is it for this section.